Hi, this is Chapter 3, Section 6, Energy and Nutrition. So we know that the energy that we need to live and to breathe and to move comes from the food that we eat. And the energy in the food is a form of chemical energy, which is actually a form of potential energy. It's energy that's stored in the arrangements of atoms in the matter that makes up the food, or it's stored in the bonds between the atoms. Okay. Today we're going to talk a little bit more about the kind of energy stored in food. Right. The food energy is typically measured in calories, okay? but these are calories with a capital C. Seems trivial, but it's actually important because this makes it a little bit different from the calorie unit that we've been dealing with until now. We'll get to that difference in a moment. Calorimetry is the method for measuring the energy content of a substance like food. Right? Typically, what happens is that you take the substance and you burn it to release the energy, that energy flows or transfers into another reference substance, and by observing the temperature change in the reference substance, you can calculate how much energy was transferred. Right? And the instrument that we use to do that is called a calorimeter. So this is a rough diagram or schematic of a typical calorimeter. Okay? Most of them consist of an inner chamber here, the sample chamber or the combustion chamber, and this is where you put the substance that you want to measure the energy content of. Uh, it can be anything, but in this case we're going to be talking about this for food, so we'll say that it's a food sample. And then this inner chamber is surrounded by an outer chamber filled with a very precise mass of water. Okay? Well, that'll become important later. So if we go step by step through this, well, the first thing we do is, again, place our sample into the inner chamber, the combustion chamber, right? So in this case, just to give uh, some numbers to this, say that we put one gram of sugar into the inner chamber. That's the food that we're going to try and measure the energy content for. Okay? And then the other thing we want to do is measure the initial temperature of the water in the outer chamber using this thermometer. So say the initial temperature in this case is 20 degrees Celsius, okay? And I also said that we want to know or measure precisely the volume or the mass of the water in the outer chamber. So when we set up this calorimeter, uh, before we do the experiment, we would put in a very precise volume. So in this case, say we put in a liter of water. A liter is 1,000 milliliters, and the density of water is one gram per milliliter. So a liter of water is 1,000 grams of water. Okay. So in this experiment, we're going to be burning the sugar. It's going to release its energy and it's going to go into the water and change the temperature of the water. That's why we measured the initial temperature of the water. Okay. So that's what we do next. We burn the sample. Okay. You use this, these ignition wires, they run a current through them, they heat up, and it causes the sample to burst into flames, to, to combust. As the sample combusts, the energy that's released during combustion starts to flow out of the inner chamber into the water in the surrounding chamber. Okay? Uh, but then it stops there and it all goes into the water because we have this insulated outer wall here. So this is all in an insulated container. So all of the energy that's lost from the food combusting should go into the water. right? And it shouldn't be lost to the environment. So we do this, and then the temperature change of the water is recorded, right? We look at our thermometer again, we measure the temperature, we observe that the final temperature now, in this case, we'll say it went up to 24 degrees Celsius, okay? So these are really the only observations that we need to make in order to perform the calculation and figure out how much energy was in the sugar. The only other piece of information we need is the heat equation and the associated specific heat for water. So let me erase some of this. Okay. So we can see here the heat equation that we learned last time. Specific heat equals the heat divided by the mass times delta T. Right? And we're talking now about observing the temperature change in the water. So this delta T is how the water changes temperature. And the water changes temperature because heat goes from the sugar burning into the water. So that heat is here. Right? And this is what we really want to find out. This is what we're looking for. So we can observe the temperature change just by taking the temperature of the water, and we measure the precise mass of water that we put in, okay? and we want to know the heat. So the last thing we need is the specific heat for water. Okay? So this, for this whole equation, 
all of these variables are going to refer to the water, the specific heat of the water, the mass of the water, the temperature change of the water. And this heat is going to be the heat that went into the water. And then we just have to understand that it's the same heat that came out of the sugar. Okay, So we can take this formula and rearrange it to get this related uh, equation down here. And then we can just solve this, right? So we have heat equals the specific heat of water, which I didn't mention yet, but from last time we remember that this is one calorie per gram degree Celsius. It takes one calorie of energy to raise a gram of water by one degree Celsius. So this is the number that we put in for specific heat, calorie per gram degree Celsius. And then the mass of the water, again, we put in a liter, which is a thousand grams. And then the delta T, now keep in mind, remember, this is not the final temperature or the initial temperature. It's the difference between them. So you take the final temperature, 24 degrees, and you subtract the initial temperature, 20 degrees. And so what you get is 4 degrees Celsius. Okay? This is the temperature change. So then we can just solve this equation. Heat equals 1 times 1,000 times 4. So it equals 4,000. 4,000 what? Again, the units come from the numbers that you put in. So the grams in the mass of the water cancels the grams in the denominator of the specific heat unit. The degree Celsius and the temperature change cancels the degree Celsius in the denominator here. And so we're left with a unit of calories. So 4,000 calories. Notice I wrote this with a small c because the specific heat of water has calories with a small c. Okay, so this is 4 kilocalories. 4,000 calories, 1,000 calories is a kilocalorie, so this is 4 kilocalories. So what we found is that one gram of sugar, when it's burned, it releases 4 kilocalories of energy. This is what our calorimetry experiment has shown. Now, there are different types of food. Sugar is a type of carbohydrate, but you also have fats and proteins. These are the energy sources in our diet. And the they each contain a different amount of energy on average. So if we do this calorimetry experiment over and over again for different types of carbohydrates, let's just look at carbohydrates for now, then what we find is that some of them have a little bit more than four kilocalories per gram, some of them a little bit less, but overall the average is that carbohydrates contain four kilocalories per gram. Okay? So this is their caloric value. It's a measure of the energy content of the food usually given on a per gram basis, right? So it might be measured in kilojoules or kilocalories or what have you, but it's usually given per gram, okay? So one gram releases four kilocalories. That means if you have two grams, it'll release eight kilocalories, right? Two times four. Fat, on the other hand, if we look at fat and we put different kinds of fat into a calorimeter, when we burn these, we'll find that on average, a gram of fat releases nine kilocalories of energy. And then protein is similar to carbohydrates because it releases four kilocalories of energy. Okay? So these are the energy contents or the caloric values for the three different types of food. Okay? Really the three different macronutrients. There are a lot of other things in your diet that you might need for your metabolism and things like that. But carbohydrates, fats, and proteins are the place where you get uh, energy in your diet. They're the source of energy. Okay. So you do, you should memorize this column. You should know these caloric values for these different food types. You don't need to know the kilojoules, right? If you are given the relationship between joules and calories, you should be able to convert, obviously. Uh, but this is the, the column that you want to remember, right? So carbohydrates and proteins are both four kilocalories per gram and fats are nine kilocalories per gram. They are, fats are more energy dense. They store more energy per gram than the other two food types. That's one of the reasons that they're used as a food storage in your body. So your body converts things to fat to store the energy for later. So here we see how this is uh, put into practice in a food label, right? So a typical food label shows uh, the energy written in calories, capital C calories, right? So here you can see calories per serving in this case. So they say per serving in this case, a serving is about 14 crackers or 31 grams of crackers. So if you eat 31 grams of these crackers, you'll absorb 130 calories, okay? 130 calories from those crackers. And then 
those calories are further broken down into the three different types, right? So you have total fat, you have total carbohydrates, and you have proteins, okay? So you see other things, cholesterol, sodium, those are not energy sources. Again, they're important for your diet, but they're not sources of energy. So the total fat is four grams in this case, and it's broken down into different types. You have saturated fats, trans fats, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated. We'll learn about that much later in the, in the uh, course. And then carbohydrates are also broken down, in this case, into fiber, and sugars, those are the two given here. There are other types, but this one, this particular product only breaks it down to these. And then proteins is sometimes not broken down. So this is just the total proteins, which is two grams. Okay. So these calories that we're looking at are dietary calories. Okay. And the dietary or nutritional calorie is different from the scientific calorie that we've been learning until now. So one dietary calorie with a capital C is actually equal to a thousand of the calories that we've been learning about. Okay? So in other words, a dietary calorie with a capital C is really a kilocalorie. So when we talk about the energy density of carbohydrates, right, it's four uh, kilocalories per gram, or you could say it's four capital C calories per gram. You just have to be very careful that you make it clear that this is a capital. Okay. Here we see a chart that breaks down a bunch of common foods into their different uh, energy contents, right? Depending on the carbohydrate, fat, or protein content in them. So you can see uh, some fruits like apples and bananas tend to be uh, really just carbohydrates with very little fat or protein. In fact, they're mostly sugars and fibers. Uh, beef has very little carbohydrate. It's mostly fat and protein, okay? Um, here we have milk. This is non-fat milk, so it has carbohydrates. Lactose, for instance, is a carbohydrate, and it has protein, but it doesn't have fat because they've taken the fat out. Whole milk will also have fat. Whole milk is pretty well balanced between all three types. Okay? Steak down here, you can see it's very high in fat and has a lot of protein, like all meat does. So usually in our diets, we get our protein from meat, although you can get it from plant sources as well. But it's important to make sure that your diet has a combination of all three of these things in a, in a balanced way. So we can take these uh, breakdowns of the different food types and what kinds of nutrients are in them, macronutrients are in them, and we can figure out the calories in the food. Okay, so in this case, for example, we have a cup of whole milk contains 13 grams of carbohydrates, 9 grams of fat, and 9 grams of protein. So they're telling us the mass of the different food types in them, and then it's asking how many kilocalories does a cup of this milk have, a cup of whole milk contain. And it says to round your answer to the tens place, that's because there's not, not much precision in those uh, average caloric values. So typically these are all rounded to the tens place, and the the numbers that you see on the nutrition facts are to the tenths place, and there's even some tolerance in those numbers. So how do you do a problem like this? Well, you know that you're given the masses of the different macronutrients, right? The mass of carbohydrates and fats and proteins. And you know that you need the kilocalories. That's what it says. How many kilocalories? Very straightforward, right? So the thing that you need to connect them is what relates the mass of a food type to the energy, and that is the caloric value, the energy value of the food type. Okay. So this is how you do it, right? You take the mass of the particular food type, so 13 grams of carbohydrates, and we know from that chart that I told you you need to remember that carbohydrates typically contain four kilocalories per gram. So if you multiply the mass times the kilocalories per gram, then 13 times 4 is really 52, but round everything to the tens place, right? And so 52 rounds to 50 kilocalories. Okay? 9 grams of fat, the energy density or caloric value of fat is 9 kilocalories per gram. So 9 grams times 9 kilocalories per gram, right? The gram unit cancels out. Same thing it did up here. And so 9 times 9 is 81, but again, we'll round that to 80 kilocalories. And then 9 grams of protein, the energy density is 4 again, so 9 times 4 would be 36. That's going to round up to 40. Okay? So these are the contributions to the total caloric content of this cup of whole milk from each of the different parts. Right? Most of the calories comes from 
the fat. 80 calories comes from the fat because it's more energy dense. 50 calories comes from carbohydrates, and then 40 calories comes from the protein. So if we want to know the total kilocalories, right, it says how many kilocalories does the cup of whole milk contain in total, it's implied, then we're going to want to add all these together. Okay, so here we have 50 plus 80 plus 40 is 170 kilocalories in this cup of whole milk. Okay? So this is how you would look at a breakdown of the masses of the macronutrients in a food and figure out the caloric content of the food. Okay. So obviously this uh, is all related to basic ideas in our everyday life, such as something some people worry about, which is weight loss, right? So the number of kilocalories or kilojoules required by your diet depends on a lot of factors. It depends on how active you are. It depends on your age. It depends on your, uh, your gender or your hormonal balance and things like that. Um, so these are showing some examples of energy, right? Sleeping, this is kilocalories is kilojoules. So you have energy from sleeping is pretty small, but the energy for running is pretty high. So these are the different kinds of activities that might uh, you might engage in as a, an adult, right? Uh, so the idea here is that you have a certain number of calories that you need to take in every day to for your body to function properly. Um, and your book says, and this slide said originally that, you know, the, if you take in more calories than you burn in your activity, then you're going to gain weight. And overall, that's true. I mean, that's strictly true and overall over your entire lifetime. Um, but it assumes that your metabolism is static. And most modern research in this area acknowledges that your metabolism is actually very dynamic and it changes based on your diet quite a bit. Uh, so it's actually true that if you take in fewer calories, if you take in, if you cut your calories enough, your body will sometimes think that you're in a situation where it needs to start preserving its energy, right? Maybe you're storing up for the winter or something like that. So where if food is scarce, your body is going to want to become more efficient and slow down its metabolism to not burn so much. So if you cut your calories, you can actually decrease your metabolism to the point that you start to gain weight. You increase your mass, right? So weight loss a lot of people think weight loss is as straightforward as just, you know, stop eating, but it's not. It's about your activity, for one thing, your exercise and your activity level, but it's also about the balance of the three different macronutrients and how those affect your metabolism and your hormone levels, right? If you eat too much carbohydrates, that triggers your body to release more insulin, uh, which can put you into a different state, which will cause you to be at risk for diabetes and to gain weight and things like this. Okay. So I'm not a nutritionist. If you have any questions about this, you should certainly consult a nutritionist, but I think it's just important to recognize that it's not really as simple as, you know, eat less, lose weight. 